record? On record? It's 5.07 and I call to order the Lincoln City Urban Renewal Agency meeting of May 22nd, 2017. Um, roll call, please. Susan Walkie. Present. Here. <laughs> Kip Ward. Here. Don Williams. Here. Dick Anderson. Yes. Riley Hoagland is excused. Deanna Hinton. Here. Judy Casper. Here. Next item on the agenda is comments from citizens present. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to bring to the agency's attention any item not listed on the agenda. Comments will be limited to five minutes per citizen and the city recorder will use the light system. Speakers may not yield their time to others. As a general rule, this is not a time for exchange of questions. However, at the conclusion of this agenda item, a counselor can discuss or raise questions regarding an item presented by a citizen. The chair has the authority to reduce the time allowed for comment in accordance with the number of persons present and signed up to speak. And I think we had a sign-up sheet. To, can someone bring it forward? I don't have the sign-up sheet oh. yet, but oh, there are a couple of people in the audience that would like to speak. Okay. Um, Donna Morris, would you like to come forward? Please state your name for the record. No need for an address. Uh, my name is Donna Morris, a resident of Lincoln City. Um, I was sent down here by Joe Clark to, uh, I went just, and she said to be sure to tell you thank you for um, allowing us to uh, make, to, uh, to have the workforce, the workforce housing plan on your agenda to be discussed. Um, and obviously it's a, a great need for the, for the city and for the workers and um, and I know that you're concerned about costs. So if you, know, if you have a chance to look at what I just passed out, Joe called, uh, put together um, several, 12 pages worth of possible grants and funding that you could you know, apply for uh, to pay for some of it. And it would be as um, you know, matching funds. So um, like, it's, like I say, please, you know, really consider this. It's an, a really big need in the city and, it, and um, you know, that's, you know, that's basically it. It's like, I'm, and I know that you all know that that, that that is and that you do what you can. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Anyone else wish to please come forward? Please state your name for the record. Okay, my name is Lynn Rudstrom, and I'm the president of Lincoln City Homeless Solutions. We provide information referral and resource counseling for 15 agencies, operate a 24 7 hotline for homeless and low income people. We are in desperate need of a place to have services, both as a shelter and an office where we can meet with people to forward them in their lives and provide for their basic needs. We have approximately 17 agencies here in Lincoln City, most of whom are run by volunteers. All, all these agencies provide low-cost services, uh, no cost to the city um, for things like laundry services, um, household goods, food, um, laundry, everything we can do to meet people's basic needs. And as a group of people, um, we've been very involved in trying to get a shelter. There is a critical need for a shelter here, especially in the winter. And it, th with the housing situation, the way it is, things are not getting better and we're gonna have more and more people needing housing unless uh, we're providing more housing as a city. So all I, all I would like to do is to remind you of how important 
funding is for our shelter. I also do grant writing, and most of our grants require at least a 30% match uh, from a local entity prior to receiving large amounts of money. They want to make sure that we have the, the support from the local entities um, to, to receive these grants. So it's critical that the city help us provide some resources so that we can get out and get these grants. And that, that's all I have to say. And I really thank you. I know many of you have been involved in this effort and are, are supportive of what we're doing. And we can't, as a group of homeless providers, thank you enough for taking an interest in this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to come forward and speak this evening? Okay. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is minutes, and we have none. And the next item, special order of business presentations. Um, Ms. Robertson, we have a an item entitled Bond Sale Project Prioritization. Are you going to help us with this discussion? <laughs> Good evening. Um, I'm here with Mr. Chandler so that we can answer any questions you might have in making this challenging decision. Um, as uh, the staff report mentions, uh, you've done some work so far in narrowing down a very hefty list of possible projects with the last remaining bond funds, uh, just under $3 million. And um, your short list of potential projects is in the staff report. Um, I'm happy to speak more about each one if that's helpful or try to answer any questions, provide more information, wh whatever you feel would be helpful in discussion and decision. And is it, are we going to be deciding on these tonight? That, that's the goal. <laughs> and we had a, <clears throat> a little dot issue that we were going to do or a plan that seemed to have gone by the wayside. Do we know why that did? I, I, heard, I heard that idea, but I didn't get clear direction to, to implement that. I apologize. What I heard was that there wasn't enough time at the last meeting and that you would like to have this on the agenda be the only thing on the agenda so that you could have enough time to talk about all the projects. So um, if you if you would like to do that, we can. Well, I don't know what the will of the council would be, but at one point we all agreed, or most of us agreed, that it was a good idea, then it just never happened. Okay, well, we can still do that if that's what the agency would like it's to do. It's a suggestion, but it um, I, I thought we kind of said we could condense them because there was just a certain number. It was like it was a small, manageable kind of number. Was there some kind of discussion like that? No? Uh, I, think, um, I remember that discussion in context of the city priorities. I don't remember that discussion in the context ah. of the URA short okay. list of projects. I'm afraid I missed a meeting, so I'm unclear uh, <coughs> that was the city so so what <laughs> we're looking at is that we have the D Lake, D Lake utility undergrounding the economic development toolbox the sanitary sewer line slash stormwater improvements the teen slash youth center homelessness center workforce housing child care facility internet access and parks that was the short list that you had, and then there were projects that were associated with those. Uh, you have $2.975 million that will be this bond issue, and um, about uh, $400,000 mm -hmm. um, that will, looks like will be the ending fund balance uh, for this year that's uh, remaining. And so uh, we need you to be able to tell us uh, the amount. If you recall, we had originally talked about proceeding with the bond and then you would be able to narrow it. The problem with that is that uh, we would end up paying interest uh, uh, the longer it drug out that we would be paying interest on construction projects or projects we have not begun. And so to save the city the cost of the interest, the bond council recommended that you, um, you select your priorities before we go out to issuing the bond. Um, prior to any further discussion, um, I need to 
state that I met with a statutory conflict of interest and must declare a potential conflict of interest. My part-time salary is paid from a grant which was awarded to Bama from the Urban Renewal Economic Development Toolbox in 2014 prior to my election to City Council. Today we're discussing urban re renewal priorities and one of our possible projects to fund is the Economic Development Toolbox which encompasses a wide variety of programs. This puts me in a class of potential, potentially affected persons. All business owners in the urban rural district are also potentially affected persons. I will participate in today's discussion <coughs> regarding urban renewal priorities. Do you need um, any information or reminders? For example, we had sanitary sewer line storm water improvements. Do you need a reminder of what that project actually is, or do you have enough information to proceed? Agency members have to say. What do you do? I've got plenty of information. The, the also the issue is we have a counselor who is available by phone uh, to vote if it's, if it's uh, acceptable. Well, I think that the biggest ticket item financially um, on this list is the undergrounding. And if we could get a consensus on how we feel about the undergrounding, that might give us a direction to go after that. How do other agency members feel about that? I agree, and agree. I'm in favor of undergrounding. I am in favor of putting money towards that undergrounding also, get that project that has been started, completed. Madam Chair. I, I still stand in opposition to it. I don't think it's a wise use of taxpayer dollars. I'm in favor of it. And the study's already been done, so this is just to do the work, right? The study has already been done, so this is just all the preliminary work's been done on this, so this is just to move forward. Isn't that correct? This would be the actual project. Right. Yeah. I'm for it. I'm in favor of a modified version of it. Um, <clears throat> I think that it should begin at the beginning of the D River Way, D River Wayside Park, and end at the end of the D River Wayside Park. Not run it back up to is it Sixth Street or up to Sixth Street? Uh, Miss Robertson, can you give us some clarification on the reasons for the boundaries? Sure, we, we um, originally looked at doing one side of the street and, um, and we looked at basically, as you mentioned, 6th Street down to, um, I believe it's 3rd, 2nd, I think it's 2nd Drive, um, which is just basically the next street on the, on the west side of the highway after the bridge, to the north of the bridge. And um, we also looked at extending it through, there's a section, um, that is actually challenging in terms of sidewalk width with the telephone poles. We looked at extending it um, through that section as well and it really became a cost driver and the decision for the current footprint for the project um, was decided based on where the view shed is. Um, we did some photographs as we were kind of what we call windshield survey as where one person's driving and one person is taking pictures as you drive along the highway so that you can see where where is the ocean visible as you're driving or walking along the highway. And then that really became the deciding factor about where the view shed begins and ends. And that is where the wires needed to go underground. Now when you put wires underground, um, it usually ends up being a little more complicated in terms of the engineering and the design because when you drop the wire, it has to go into a vault box and you have to make sure the vault box, let's say, isn't in a driveway or isn't in a public um, sidewalk or, you know, that, that that large vault box is properly located. So after you decide where you want the wires gone from, then you have to kind of look at the footprint of development and see 
where practically speaking is it going to be most efficient for cost and for physicality for that project to begin or end. And so those are the reasons why um, it is where it is now in the design. And then also the other thing is um, there was a decision to put both sides of the highway underground. Um, and I think the reason for that was it was not significantly more expensive. And the reason it wasn't significantly more expensive is because when you move all those wires, that would be basically like a relocation. So when you, when you put the power poles down and you put the, the lines underground, there would still be a need for some connections on the east side of the highway. And in order to maintain those, um, the requirements for overhead power lines or telecommunications lines are um, very, very large poles. And the cost of those poles, they're really giant metal poles that don't need to be guy-wired um, to accommodate wind forces. And so those poles are so expensive that I think it was, uh, I don't have it in front of me, I, I want to say like 30 to 60,000 more in comparison to millions in order to do both sides of the highway rather than just the west side. So what we did, we, we got a little ways into the design and then the question was, well, why are we going to leave them on one side if we're paying this much money to underground them? And what would be the cost difference? And so the agency at that time, in the middle of the design, said, let's do a modification and complete the design for both sides of Highway 101. So what would be the cost difference between going on both sides and uh, clear to 6th Street, which is put you in front of the D, D, or D Sands? and back to 2nd Street, which takes you 200 feet north of Kylo's, roughly. Right? Um, uh, what's, so what's doing just in front of the D River Wayside versus doing both sides and expanding it out to 6th and 2nd, uh, what's the cost difference? Yeah, I, I don't know what that would be. I'd have to contract with our engineers to ask them to redo a cost estimate. That I can tell you that I think it's a quarter of the cost is just to go under the river. Um, so, so that is kind of a challenging, you know, it's a small river, but they still have to do the bore underneath. So that's part of it. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. You know, the reason why it ends at 2nd Street is because there was room for the vault box there. That was the earliest opportunity that we could find a place to finish the project. Um, why it goes in front of the D Sands is because as you're coming north on Highway 101, there is a view shed there because the D Sands is set back from the highway uh, and they have driveways and parking and there's public right of way. So we did not want to interrupt that with, with the vault boxes. So we really tried to capture that view shed specifically. So I, I don't have an answer, but if, if you all would like an answer, I can work on one. Well, I don't want to hamstring the process. I'm just I'm, mm -hmm. I'm concerned that you know this is our biggest project. I'm a, I'm a big undergrounder fan, mm -hmm. so if this is a big project. I'm a, I'm afraid that the cost because things tend to ch tend to escalate, particularly when you go under a river. Um, uh, I'm just concerned that that might eat. Up. That might be the only thing that we get. And yeah, the the cost estimate we had. Um, Public Works was kind enough to spend some time to look at our cost estimate, and uh, based on their experience with some recent projects, talk about how they see it would be higher based on our design, and they did accommodate that. Uh, let's see if I can find that. So um, in your, your mega luff list that was given to you a few months ago, um, the cost estimate for construction is about two million. Um, construction management would be 50,000. The D River easements would be 140,000 and does not include any redesign of the plans which were completed in March of 2015 
and so far those design costs that we have spent so far uh, about 144,000, um, and and so total cost estimate is 2.2 million, and that's based on the current design, with a little added information from recent projects. So, that is the most up-to-date information that we have. And we have 3.4 million. Uh huh. I have, we have 3.4. There's about 400,000 left, uh, left over. Uh, there are some, uh, as you might remember, the um, Public Works Department bid the North 50th Street uh, pump station upgrade, which we had uh, allocated, I think, about a million for, and that came in under budget. So there is some left over from that. And then with the new bond funds, uh, it's about 3.4 total. And if you might remember in your staff report, if we find, um, I think at the last meeting there was a question about if we if we want to do one project, how flexible is the money and can we use it, can we move it to a different project? And the bond council said that for the type of bond that you all have been talking about getting, which is uh, a taxable bond that's backed by urban renewal, not backed by the city, then that is really the most flexible of types of bonds. So if you, you know, decide on one or two or however many projects for some amount of money and then you need additional funds, then you can use those funds however you decide. The, the question, or the question, the, the catch is what Mr. Chandler mentioned about if you have the funds sitting in an account, then you're paying interest on them um, and not moving the projects forward. So that would be the only kind of timing that we need to make sure we're getting as close as possible on decisions for implementing the projects. Allison, do you know how much, what the cost, from your experience, how much does it cost to bury each telephone pole or power pole? That's a great question. I um, I don't know. Well, we buried lots of them. Yeah, and, and it's been a couple years since I've looked very closely at those plans that, that we had finished. Um, I don't know. I just remember looking at a, quor a quarter of the cost would be to go under the river. Um, but per pole, I don't know. I mean, each, each environment's different. It depends on how many poles you want to bury. So, uh, I, I just I don't have an answer. I, I could okay. ask and see. I don't know if there's a magic number or a range. Yeah, I would be interested to hear that. Okay. Um, if I if I may add one more thing, um, this may or may not be helpful to you. I did talk with uh, Pacific Power about. Um, do they like undergrounding? Do they not like undergrounding? And they did say that they don't have a preference. Um, I'm sure you can imagine they, there are pros and cons. Um, but basically what it comes down to is every area is unique. Um, and they, um, they do say there's pros and cons. The aesthetics are certainly more appealing with undergrounding and is a key driver for most requests for undergrounding. There is some protection from weather-related elements, but this could be outweighed by the difficulty we face when we have an underground issue. The primary reason customers opt to stay overhead is due to the high cost of placing facilities underground in the first place. Also, as I mentioned, it's more difficult for us to locate issues underground, which can increase outage restoration time. So it's kind of this, you know, it's better, less outages possibly by being underground, but harder to find them possibly, and everything's possibly, and there's no real certainty in what they have. Um, they did look at, um, so we do have Taft and Ocean Lake, which are already undergrounded, as opposed to Road's End, for example. And um, Taft had 17 outages. This was in a two-year period of time. Taft had 17 outages, and Ocean Lake had 38. Um, However, the outages in Ocean Lake were only 5.8 minutes. And in Taft, even though they had fewer outages, the outages were 693 minutes. 
Uh, so I asked more about that, and they just don't have information about if the outages were planned or not planned. Um, but it's just it's it's not really an apples to apples sort of a thing. You know, could be the water table in Taft versus Ocean Lake. I mean, there are all all kinds of explanations, and you can't generalize that one area means the other area is going to be the same. So I um, hesitated to bring that up, but basically <laughs> Pacific Power doesn't take a stance and it's really, of course, driven by cost and aesthetics. Those are the main reasons why, why it's done. Have we ever, ever underground under a river? Um, urban renewal has not. The city, the city has undergrounded, but they didn't do it for aesthetics, they did it for basic services like water and sewer and, you know, um, the basic public works. But they weren't electrical lines? Mm -mm. Not that I'm aware of. And I understand that they would drill down to 30 feet below? I think that's what Lila mentioned. I think so. So, Councillor yes. Casper, yes. Um, do you have an opinion on the do I, uh, what we put on the table, the undergrounding, and looking to at least see if that's on or off the table? I don't think I'd be in favor of it. Well, how are we going to deal uh, Can we with contact um, Mr. Hoagland? Yeah. Um, we, that's why I went to talk to Bill. It, it, we're not set up for a telephonic participation, and we, we actually gave Bill no advance notice of that. So uh, Riley had actually emailed Kathy, and that's what we were over here conferring about. So. But his phone would still work, wouldn't it? Well, but it's one thing to call them on the phone and say, how do you vote on this? It's another thing to telephonically attend uh, a public meeting. So you don't, you don't just call them and say, how do you vote? You, you, he would actually listen in on the, on the meeting. And uh, we would, the public needs to be aware that he's on the line, so. Yes, Councilor Ward, I don't know what his position was. Uh, so we don't know. I mean, I like undergrounding for certain, um, but I just don't want all the all of the funds taken by one project. I mean, that's what I'm frightened about because a lot of people have a lot of wants, and I've I've seen undergrounding uh, kind of spin out of control as far as going under a, a river, and the prices go out of the costs go out of control as well. Uh, How many years ago was that? Hmm. Two. <laughs> Two? Oh. Yeah. I'm, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. Are you talking about pipes? Are we? Or are you talking about past sewer water yeah. project? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just one more. But we have found a contractor who yeah. has done it well. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to get a passionate plea from me. <laughs> Period. That is just... Uh, it's, it's the biggest one, and I, you know, we. Madam Chair, I think I have passionately in the past um, talked about um, why I think it's a good idea to do it for the city for the long term, um, for visitors as well as those of us who drive around the corner and there's the beautiful ocean. And it is the first um, view of the ocean for people who are coming to the city. And I think um, long term, it's going to make a lot of difference. Right now, with all of um, with all of the wires, it just looks cluttered, and and um, you know, it just doesn't have the the presentation, let's say, for the city that we could have if we cleaned up that look. So I'm a hundred percent for it. That makes three of us. I'm not wobbly at all. I'm just a little <laughs> negotiation here. I mean, if we can, 
I, I, I hate wires. I wish we could get them out of the whole city. And I wish going back over the urban renewal time, I know we had a lot of undergrounding and stuff to do, but I would have liked to have done more of it. Uh, again, the only thing that's, that's stopping me from being 100% is that looking at the list that everyone put there, everyone had their little, I don't mean to minimize them, but everyone had their projects. And I would just hate to have one project done and five or six people not get to do their project. And I don't really have a project. <laughs> Mine's blight, and I'm going to address yeah. that wherever it goes. And, and I feel that, that blight is what we should be addressing, and some of these issues aren't necessarily blight, in my opinion, um, and that we could find other the city council could find city money um, to cover some of these other projects. Well, also, I, I don't I'm sorry. think that the projects should be ignored. I'm right. right. Um, I we've got a lot of property that's going up for sale, and um, and if as as we uh, get them more liquid. Um, that should be a significant pool of money if we get aggressive as far as getting them out there. And uh, and then we can use four, I mean, if we put a, if we sell that property and, and put enough in a pool, we can actually afford to go out and buy a piece of blighted property, unblight it, and then put it on the market and do the same over and over again. But we can't do that if we don't have any capital in our bucket. Um, so um, that's another way to address it, to be able to have both if you want. But we, you know, I think we need to be kind of single-minded and, and, and get these properties sold so uh, we can do things that are, that are going to look a lot nicer for our, our community. To clarify things, we have $3.4 million in the urban renewal budget, but the urban renewal agency also owns real property, correct? Yes. So if we were to sell at least part of that, we would have additional funds. Yes, and uh, so far what we're doing is developing those four properties. Uh, until we really advertise them and know what development partnerships are going to be uh, necessary and available in order to implement those development projects, we don't know if we will make a profit on that. Um, if you prefer to just sell it straight out and not actually partner in order to get the development to happen, um, it, it's hard for me to, again, I would love to have a crystal ball, but I just can't guarantee that it won't even cost money to develop. It just depends on how many development conditions we will be placing on the property in order to accomplish those objectives. So those partnerships would, would decrease the sale proceeds, okay? Um, it just depends on what we will require of the developer. Okay. If we say we want this many square feet, we want it to look like this, we want it to have uh, this use that may or may not be feasible for the market, but we are, we as a city and a community are wanting to have this use, um, there are, the more conditions we put on the property, the less profitable, profitable it can become. Um, if we say, here's the property, tell us what you want to build, and then we will say if, if we want that or not, uh, there's a risk with that because if, if we're in a position of just hearing what the developers want for years to come and we don't find anything satisfactory, then developers won't be interested in trying to partner with us anymore because they'll say we're not serious. So mm -hmm. somewhere in between is the sweet spot of what's the minimum that the agency is wanting to see from the property development and what is the market's response to doing that project? And until we know both of those things, we won't know what the development and disposition agreement is with the developer, which is a negotiated closed door process, until we arrive at something that's agreeable in order to implement the project. So um, it's, it's just hard to predict. They're all four very different properties. They're in different parts of town. Um, you know, small to larger, but they're still all relatively small. So until we get further down the road, we it, it's going to be hard to know 
um, you know, we've done a lot of work at those properties to bring uh, the sidewalks up, you know, and, and redo the, the street and all kinds of things that would make the properties more attractive to developers. So I think we've done a lot of work in that respect, but until we get there, we won't know how that will unfold. So, if I may, um, just to move us along, I'm looking at the clock and getting a little worried. Um, I have, I have an idea. <laughs> Some of these, um, just as you have said, um, Madam Chair, look like they could be funded elsewhere. So I'm going to take the first stab at maybe we can keep the projects but move them to a different budget out of urban renewal. And you'll and you can be the backstop saying no, we can't do that. Okay, you may be the backstop. On okay. that one. Well, one of you, <laughs> help me out here. Okay, so the third bullet, sanitary sewer line, and stormwater improvements. I say move that to the city budget. And the teen in the youth center. I say move that to um, the city under parks and and that needs some study to find out exactly what we're looking at there. And the next budget, which is the homeless center, um, move that to the city budget, because we already have some budget, a budget line item for that. And then I need some more help with the next one, so then skip that and we'll come back to it. And the child care facility, I have a, an idea. I don't know if it's a good one, but potentially that could be um, in the same facility as the teen center and perhaps we can do some, um, there's some training available to train students how to um, do child care and it might be, it might be a good um, way to get um, some work experience for them. But anyway, that's one idea. Um, and then the last one, skip internet for a minute. And then the last one, um, um, parks. I'd say move that to the city budget as well because we now that we have a plan, I think it fits um, under there. Now, if we go back up to workforce housing, um, urban renewal plan number 19, um, I've forgotten exactly what that is. This is in our urban renewal plan as a possible project and it basically allows the agency to use money to partner on workforce housing developments. Um, that that's a project that we've had in our plan since I believe 2009. Um, it's under economic development and we just have not had any interest. You know, most of the urban renewal district is commercial and not residential. Mm -hmm. There are some residential areas um, like in Cutler City that's mostly residential except for on the highway. Uh, but most of the urban renewal district is commercial. So we haven't had, um, uh, planning department is great in letting me know when there's a site plan review meeting and if the property is located in the urban renewal district, I do attend and uh, we just haven't had workforce housing as a development coming forward. There have been some inquiries but um, as far as having them in the urban renewal district and workforce, specifically addressing workforce housing, since so 2009 I haven't heard any so then should we move that because we already have workforce housing under the city budget? Would that it's, be essentially, it's essentially a financial incentive to, that would be used for developers uh, to, uh, to include or to develop workforce housing within a project. And we don't quite have that under the city budget, but is that something we could consider? Sure. I mean, I'm just trying to sure. get our list sorted here. Yeah, also in the economic development toolbox, uh, as we've talked about in the past, you know, there are some tools that are out and available for use, and then there are a number of tools that are ideas that uh, could be considered as moving those out, and some of those would help with development in general and could be tailored specifically for workforce housing. I just don't know how many properties that really is because we haven't actually looked at the urban renewal district in terms of housing before. Um, okay. It might be one property, it might be 10 properties, it might be no property. So that so. bullet, you'd be comfortable with moving to the city and then we still have it under the toolbox if we need it? It's, it's, up, to, it's up to you all. I mean, it, I'm it just could trying be to shorten a, it, our list. The funds could come from a different source, yes. 
um, and whether it ends up under the economic development department or whatever in the future, we can talk about that. Okay. Um, and then back up to the internet access. Um, I know that um, member Casper has her hands all over this one, so I'm going to tread carefully. Um, I would suggest that this bullet um, do all of the background work to find the costs associated with this type of project, identify the users, and research potential partners, etc. Kind of go on a fishing mission to put all these things together, and then um, because how do we know how much that is? My concern with this issue is that we're talking about community fiber. Um, an urban renewal agency can only deal with things in the urban renewal district. So I think if we really want citywide internet access, it needs to be a city budget issue, not an urban renewal district. Good point. I hadn't thought of that. Um, and the child care facility is a possibility in the economic development toolbox. So okay. that is covered by the economic development toolbox. Okay, so we aren't losing it. We're just, you know. It's already there in the okay. toolbox. So, f so far we haven't lost anything on this list. We've just moved them under other budgets or So you're saying these projects will still get done but not with urban renewal funds. Yeah, I'm not I'm not s suggesting any of them go away. And and the homelessness is not even called out in the urban renewal plan, so technically a homeless center would not be not part of the district would not well it, if it's not in our plan then we can't use those funds that way correct well if the agency um, decided it was a goal or objective to uh, it right here it says that um, it's not called out in the plan but it could Urban renewal could potentially involve be involved with property acquisition, infrastructure, and or property re or development. Um, but the, well, I shouldn't say but because I don't mean to minimize the issue because it is a, a big issue that the city council is addressing. Um, typically though with urban renewal, the, the overall goal and the reason why a district is created is to try to maximize um, what they call highest and best use for property, which means, um, you know, mostly getting the property back on the tax rolls in a way that creates more revenue for all of the taxing districts. That's kind of what the highest and best use means. Um, there are other uses that are, you know, community interests and city objectives that are folded into that because we try and we try and get everything accomplished as much as we can. Um, but you're right, homelessness was not specifically called out, uh, and neither was housing until 2009. So these are, these are just important current topics that are on the, on the table. Um, if, if a homelessness center was created by Urban Renewal's purchasing property uh, and there was someone to run it, um, I, I imagine, I don't know for sure, but I imagine it would probably be a nonprofit and it may be exempt from paying taxes. And so um, that's up to you as a policy decision-making body to decide if that is a value for this particular budget. So my list then only now includes the D Lake Utility Undergrounding, the Economic Development Toolbox, because we haven't lost anything again. I want to say that loud and clear, but we've been able to put our arms around more of what that budget could do here. Any 
we are about to the end of our time limit. Um, I'd entertain a motion if anyone has one. So, Madam Chair, I guess, you know, throw the ball down to the end of the dais and, you know, the guy <laughs> who's sitting on the fence, you know, who was I'm very on. eloquently indicated that he wanted to make sure everybody had their shot at their projects. I think we eliminated it down, not eliminated, but put the list down to two, two items. Um, so where are we, Councillor, where are we now as far as what everyone wanted? Uh, I don't have their list in front of me, but everyone has their, their wants and I'm not sure I know what each one of them want. Well, n now you're very frustrating. <laughs> so Good. I have like three wives that would agree with me. <laughs> <Don't go back. laughs> uh, there's been a process of uh, staff very eloquently indicated one, two, three, four, five. We're into our at least sixth meeting on this yes. same. Topic. And, and where on I proposed a system, the dot system, so well, we would know how everyone okay, we just, stood. And I, I appreciate that. We just kind of very diplomatically went through the dot system for you, uh, listing the short list of projects, mm -hmm. and very eloquently, um, Councillor Hinton put forth there are, is money in other budgets to take care of these things, except for two items that are on this list. Well, so, so generally when we're fi trying to find a place for things, you can dump them into the, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can put them into the general fund, right? But you still will need to take something out. Uh, we just can't, it's not Santa's bag. We can't just keep saying, well, uh, general fund will pay for this or that. Well, once again, to do the math, yes. three point four million yes. is in the pot. Right. Two point two is undergrounding, approximately. Okay, it's three point four and two point two. So subtract two point two from three point four. Mm -hmm. You have one point two million. One point two. Now, and two, generally, we do have a a, a ten percent uh, padding on that. Friends hey, of seas. Throw half a million in there just for the fun of it. Okay. And you still have, can you do the quick math, the, the 1.2 1. less a half a million is $700,000. Uh -huh. It could go into the toolkit, the economic tool. Just satisfying all three things, the two projects and your desire to have an overabundance of money in, in the projects. Right. Plus, plus as, as you as said. We, as we have witnessed here, though, Seven hundred thousand dollars goes away is very quickly. Is more money? No, forget. We have a half a million you already put as a reserve right. in your undergrounding, and seven hundred thousand left over for the toolkit. And as staff has indicated, there are properties that could be sold. You know, again, up to the agency, of which would be additional. So trying to demonstrate for you the overabundance of um, security there, on your There's never over an overabundance well, of money. But then that's going to be the problem um, that, you know. So, did you wish to? Go ahead, You're round spending, two. Go ahead, I mean, go get him. Five minutes. Um, again, to expedite this, is there any support for my idea amongst the members? Of what you were just speaking of, of moving these moving these over into other budgets, not losing them, but well, to fund the undergrounding and fund the tool kit toolbox. I'd second that motion. Those those two, I think the motion would be to pick those two items as your primary projects, and like you, the only projects. Okay. Um, Yes, I'd like to make that motion that our um, potential project list, if this satisfies the the bond, that's the next question. But anyway, the um, D Lake Utility Undergrounding and the Economic Development Tool Box. Do I hear a second? second? Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Discussion? 
I thought we were discussing this. No? Well, I, I would be. I would offer this compromise. Um, I would be willing to go for that, vote for that, if we shrank it up a little bit. Can we have a vote? I'll do the vote. Yeah, I mean, oh, the, same argument he made yeah. before. Yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't just because I, I should keep <laughs> just because I'm holding it doesn't make it bad. <laughs> Let's have a vote. Casper, yes. Walkie, yes. Ward, yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right, I, I just don't complain to me when we run out of money for the rest of this stuff. Yes. Yes. Williams? No. Anderson? Yes. O or, uh, Hinton? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Now, may, may I can't see you. Um, we have no public hearings. We have no resolutions. Um, agency member comments. You have two minutes. <laughs> Anyone have anything to say? I just have one follow-up question, if I may. Huh? Are we okay with this? Does this work for the for the bonding now? Can you move I, forward? I think it will. I will let you know if not. The next the next thing we'll do is to lay out the steps and bring them back to you, so that you know what the following steps are from beginning to end. M Madam Chair, one, yes, one, Mr. Real, one real quick thing. This uh, this list here of grants is this something you as our economic czar? Is that something that your office is going to be doing? Um, it, it depends on what the grants are for. Okay, this is yeah for affordable housing stuff. Yeah, um, I, I'm welcome. I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at it. it. It depends on, you know, the the economic development stuff on the city side is relatively uncharted. There's some ideas and there's maybe some funding. Um, so y yes, I mean, we'd be happy to look at it. Okay, we'll we'll be looking to you for more direction on that. So thank you. Okay, great. Right. And no further comment, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Five. Okay, mics are off for a minute. We got it done by six. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Despite the